Hi, I'm Patrick Palm, CEO and founder of Favro, and this is the Learn From Leaders podcast. The background to these interviews is that Favro clients are some of the most innovative and agile businesses out there. And it's used for collaborative planning by marketing teams, by product teams, HR, management teams. And what this means is that we get to know some truly inspiring people. So what we do in this podcast is that I invite them here for a conversation about something where they are true leaders. So we can all learn from it. Let's go. I mean, we basically have three kinds of clients. You know, it's startups, it's enterprises, and it's unicorns that are you know, trying to stay idle as they grow very fast. Uh, but if I look more industry-wise, it's also quite widespread. But one industry definitely stands out as being a, 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 a very... Uh, already a big customer base for us, but also a very rapidly growing one, and, and that is game development. And, um, you know, with, um, with that, you know, we thought, okay, we're going to do a couple of webinars now specifically uh, for, for game developers. And, 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 and today, you know, it's, it's, it's one of them. And um, I'm, I'm super excited, um, you know, Lena, that you could, you could join us. Um, you know, in one of our previous, uh, you know, webinars, we had, you know, Nico, you know, and she... You know, she was using Favor when she was at, you know, uh, Riot Games. And, you know, there it's really, you know, thousands of uses of, of, of Favor. And, and, and that was good now when Corona hit. And, and they were already, you know, very uh, used to working in, in an online fashion. Um, but then after that, you know, she was using Favor at, you know, uh, that game company, which is, you know, much smaller. Uh, you know, they make amazing games. I played many of them myself. Um, but a totally different setting, you know, like, you know, small studio, you know, very indie, uh, you know, extremely creative, you know, you know, I, I don't know them well enough to, to, to say, but I would guess that they're probably the kind of uh, studio that uh, are not super heavy on processes and, 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 you know, maybe not super heavy on tools. And, and, and I see that's a bit of a pattern that, you know, many of the studios that come on board and use, use favor are, are relatively new formula studios. Uh, that are you know maybe not necessarily the biggest you know fans of processes and tools and and it seems like you know if you're going to choose let's say uh, the the least um, uh, you know bad tools so to say you know they pick they pick Favre. and I think that as a compliment you know that that's you know if you have a developer or an artist saying you know this is not too bad you know that that, that is actually great um, uh, but anyways um, um, going into into the meat of it here, uh, I I, um, I I needed to have a look. You know, when was the first time you know I met you, Lena? And and I and I you know I searched through my emails, and it was in two thousand seven when you were at CCP in Iceland, and we just realized this is a long time ago. And I I would like to believe that it hasn't been that many years. But the thing I can conclude from just looking at that kind of email thread there, um, when. Uh, uh, Haldor, who was the CTO at the time, uh, introduced us, was that already back then, you seemed to have a lot of weight in, in an organization that was already quite big and very fast growing and putting a lot of trust in you in helping them manage the challenges of going from a little bit smaller to you know much bigger. Um, so there's been a lot of water under the bridge since then, and, and, and I'll leave that story to you, but but I can just conclude that already back then, you know, you're, you're a big name. So, you know, when we said now that, you know, you're, you're one of the top names in, in production and game development, that was probably true already 13 years ago. So, Selena, you know, why don't you, uh, you know, give us the, a bit of the story, you know, from, from the CCP to, you know, where you are today. Thank you so much, Patrick. Yeah, it's, it's hard to believe that it's such a long time since 2007, which was uh, the year after uh, I started in the games industry in, in my native Iceland at, uh, at CCP. Uh, originally, I, I studied industrial engineering and I worked in, in pharmaceutical project management. And I meant to have this very, very serious business-oriented career. Uh, and... Uh, so I worked in, in pharmaceuticals for a few years and, and I really enjoyed that. I found pharmaceutical developers to be generally uh, nerdy people with weird interests and, and I really enjoyed working with them. And, but then I felt like I should try something more, uh, something different. And, and I went into business development in retail, which was uh, excruciatingly boring. And, uh, and that's when I accidentally kind of decided that, you know, I should do something fun. And I had a lot of friends that were working for this Icelandic game company, makers of EVE Online, CCP. 
Uh, so I started working for them as a producer in, in 2007, sorry, in 2006. And, and uh, it was just for me uh, an incredible transition from the, the sort of the boring and the beige world of, of, uh, of really grown up work, either in, in pharmaceuticals or in retail. Um, and I wasn't that big of a gamer, but I was very interested in, in IP development and in science fiction and in world building. And, and CCP was definitely doing all of that with, uh, with EVE Online, which is a, a fantastic and a very unique uh, game world. And, uh, uh, and it was a company when I joined CCP back in the day, uh, they really needed people with uh, experience from kind of proper companies and, and uh, so it was, was fun for me to come and kind of apply my project management learnings uh, to a company that was so different to the other companies that I had worked for. And, uh, and CCP, during the time that I was there, grew from a company of about 150 people up to about 600 people when I left five years later and had operations in, in, uh, in Iceland and in the US and in the UK and in Shanghai. So it gave me this experience of working with distributed teams, with different cultures, uh, doing I think back then in, in 2009 and 10, doing a lot of, of remote work uh, through video conferencing, et cetera, et cetera, which seemed very new at the time, but has now become everyone's reality, I guess, in the times of, of Corona. Uh, but after five years at CCP, I was hired at uh, Ubisoft and moved with my family to uh, Malmö in Sweden where I worked on, on the project that became the division uh, before then moving over to DICE, which is a subsidiary of EA in Stockholm, where I worked on Mirror's Edge as the senior producer and then was the producer responsible for starting up and uh, running the Star Wars Battlefront franchise, which was, uh, as you can imagine, for a sci-fi geek and someone who's really into, into that type of universe like working on on the first star wars game in that big collaboration between ea and uh and lucasfilm and disney was uh, an incredible adventure and and uh so i worked with a fantastic team in in stockholm but also in in the us and uh and in canada and in the uk uh on that franchise before then moving again to Vancouver, where I worked on strategy for the FIFA franchise for two years, which was a, a completely different experience. If you can imagine, you know, making a, a, a Star Wars shooter and then going into making a, a sports video game, which is, you know, released once a year, uh, it's incredibly demanding. Everything has to happen incredibly fast. And it's one of the absolutely the biggest uh, video game franchises of the world. But it's very different to work in a, in a Swedish studio on a, on a sci-fi shooter versus a, a studio in North America on, on, uh, on a sports franchise. So I've se I feel like I've seen all kinds of teams uh, in all kinds of cultures creating all kinds of games. And, and each of these different teams and, and IPs presents a, a, a different challenge. Uh, and the FIFA team is, is incredibly large and, and uh, you know, is, is working with incredibly tight and, and uh, well-defined processes. Uh, and after two years of working there, I actually joined a, a, a small startup in uh, Southern California, where I'm right now, called Bonfire Studios, uh, where a group of uh, pretty veteran developers with a, a passion for making great games and a passion for culture have come together to make games differently than they've done before in, in, in very big companies. So I'm now working with a team of, uh, or a company of about 30 people, creating a, a new company, a new game, a new team, building new processes and new structure, all very much based on, on, on culture. So I've had quite the journey i think over these past 13 years since we first met uh, patrick <laughs> it, it, it's quite a spectrum and um, you know since since you were on the on the on the fifa team you know i have to say that you know bonfire is a little bit more than you know just veterans i mean i mean it, it, it is really a group of superstars coming together and i'm very excited to see you know what's going to come out um it's kind of like you know you created the, the manchester united of game development um you should probably read uh, Alex Ferguson's, uh, you know, book, you know, about you know how you actually manage a team when every player is a superstar, uh, because I mean that brings its own challenges. And I think Alex Ferguson's book is probably one of the best reads on you know leadership in that kind of environment. Um, 
So, um, you know, before I'm um, going into some some challenges, uh, it would be interesting, you know, do, do you have any uh, kind of you know, direct reflections upon, you know, what what could uh, a small, relatively new studio, uh, you know, learn from 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 a big, you know, money machine, you know, that the FIFA, uh, you know, franchise is, you know, and vice versa, you know, what what can, you know, you know, the big ones learn from, you know, many of these absolutely amazing uh, smaller studios that are, are are coming up now learn. I think if I if I think about you know learnings from the FIFA team, I think one of the things that uh, the FIFA team has done incredibly well, uh, because time is as, at such a premium for a, a, a yearly franchise, decision making has to be incredibly quick and scoping has to be incredibly precise, and the velocity needs to to always be kept up. And so, what I found with you know, working with FIFA developers is that they have this incredibly pragmatic production mindset, but they're also working with a super established uh, franchise and and uh, the kind of the new game discovery for every iteration of the game is is uh, is not that large. Whereas we, as a small studio, you know, we're starting with a completely blank slate. Uh, so I think that you know what what I think the learnings on both sides are are you know, having that production mindset mindset is very, very important, but you also, you can't bring it to bear too soon because you want to have space for ideation. And, and you know, we talk about making sure that we don't kill our ugly babies too early uh, at Bonfire because we want, you know, ideas, they come into the world and they're very imperfect and they get better through iteration. And, and for a long time, they're pretty ugly babies. So it's important to to you know, not kill them too soon, but then you know, don't chase something for too long when it's proven not to work. Um, and I think you know, if 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 I look back at my time in FIFA, I think also you know, coming now from a studio that's very, uh, you know, very new, it's very diverse. It's it's uh, you know, people can bring all their expertise and their opinions and their ideas. Uh, and but you know, aligning a group like that takes way longer than it does for the very homogenous, sort of very focused, very uh, process-heavy FIFA team. So I think both can learn something from from each other. But I I think that you know there are there are very very different challenges in managing these types of teams. So so speaking about challenges, I um I made a post the other day. Um, you know, just kind of looking at you know some of the figures. Um, for 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 our industry now, and I mean, what is amazing is that I mean, you know, today the game industry is bigger than the movie and the music industry combined. You know, we are literally the most successful, um, you know, part of the entertainment industry uh, today, and that has been kind of almost like sneaking upon us. You know, the last you know ten years. I mean, we're you know all all three here. You know, people that started you know before we were in that situation. We kind of you know we looked up to movies and we thought. You know those guys were really cool, and and you know now you know the biggest guys on the block are, are us, um, and um, so, so, it's, so so it's a great time to be in game development, and and um, you know my one of my side things is is I have a small investment company and I invest in 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 game studios and in game tech, and and it's it's a really good time to be an investor in in the game industry. So so all of this is very very good. Um, uh, but what we're seeing is, of course, also some challenges. You know, now Corona hit, uh, and it's very clear that studios that were prepared uh, for working in a distributed fashion have been doing really well. They have been able to continue to release, to release entirely new games, and they've been doing well. And there's been some other studios that have sometimes quite openly admitted to that. Okay, this this is this is pretty hard for us. Um, so, so one of the really big challenges we have is is just you know how do we make sure that that we can uh, we can deliver and, and take advantage of this situation as as game developers. Um, the other challenge that has been extremely topical uh, in the debate recently is diversity. Um, you know, if we look at you know the figures of who, who plays the games, it's a very diverse group. But if we look at studios it, it it is typically not a very diverse group um so so and, and for many other reasons you know this, this is also um, a, a challenge in the industry um if we start with you know maybe that question on you know on diversity um I, I think a good kickoff for that question is why why shall we care you know what why is the diversity important 
Well, I think that diversity is important because, uh, as you said, I mean, video games are, are, you know, the biggest medium on the planet right now, and they're played by everyone. And I mean, I think we see particularly with the the rise of smart uh, connected devices, people are playing games on, on all platforms, and they're playing games across uh, all ages and all genders and all ethnicities. And if you think about the power of the medium, then I think that, you know, video games different to movies or music or books, they're interactive. So the, the, the player has the ability to be way more immersed and way more engaged in the experience than they do in, in any other medium. And what research has shown, I've, I've, I've actually spent quite a bit of time uh, looking at research from uh, both games and from other industry. And uh, research shows us that, you know, what we see through media shapes our worldview. So as an example, uh, and, and, you know, taking an example that's pretty close to home, when I was growing up in my native Iceland back in the 80s, the president of Iceland was a woman, Vitis Fintodotter. She was, I didn't know that at the time, but she was the first democratically elected head of state, uh, female head of state in the world. But when I grew up, I just grew up with the idea that, you know, obviously women could be presidents. Uh, and and uh, and this has been proven that you know role models in different mediums are incredibly impactful. As an example, in 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 2013, the number of of women or girls in the U.S. that were practicing archery doubled. That's also the year that uh, the Hunger Games and Brave uh, were released. So so we have all these examples of of uh, of the way that you know media shapes behaviors, and it's incredibly powerful. So the way that I see it is as the creators of uh, the most important medium of the 21st century we have an incredible power to shape behaviors and I think that if we think about uh, you know games in the past they've had very stereotypical representations they've often been created with you know a very traditional sort of you know male in their 30s or 40s as the protagonist you know think Nathan Drake uh, from Uncharted and you know I'm not absolutely not you know uh, dissing Uncharted in, in any way I think it's a great game but I think that we haven't been super innovative in the 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 characters and the protagonists of our games but I also think that that's you know pretty logical because for most of the game studios that I've been a part of the leadership has been predominantly male the people who make decisions about which types of of games are made are predominantly male uh, and generally video game uh, make teams have operated on the basis of assumption that you know it's a male team making a game about men catered predominantly to men and so this becomes this you know completely self-fulfilling prophecy but what we see now and and you know we can take examples from movies as an example you know if you think about star wars and the way that it was rebooted it was basically uh, rebooted from being a boy franchise to being an everyone franchise uh, and you know enjoying incredible commercial success and if you look at the cast of the new Star Wars movies you can see every age group both genders every ethnicity so the data just shows us that creating inclusive experiences where everyone feels invited you know makes great business sense but it's also the right thing to do that you're not just promoting you know mindlessly promoting stereotypes Yeah, that, that's very true. I, I think a second argument is also, I mean, obviously we geek down a lot on things that have to do with, you know, organization um, and what makes, um, you know, an innovative organization. And and um, there's just a ton of research showing that a team which is more diverse um, is simply more creative. Now, that's there's a lot of people that, that, that say that and, and use that as an argument for, you know, this is why we should work with diversity. Uh, what they typically don't uh, go into is the fact that um, the, um, one of the benefits of having a more homogeneous team is that efficiency comes sooner. You know, if, if you already know each other, you're kind of the same um, group, uh, efficiency comes sooner. And so if you have a team which is, which is uh, very diverse, uh, you, need to have, you need to find other things to unite around. You know, this is very much a CEO you know, level of question. Okay, so what is it that we 
as a team are going to unite around you know what values you know where we're going and so forth and you really have to think about that and 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 then you know act on it and then you can achieve you can basically get you know the, the efficiency of a homogeneous group uh, with the creativity and innovation of a diverse group and that's when you can truly um, you know harvest you know the benefits uh, of this you know that that's that's my opinion but but I also I think as we see it quite clearly, um, you know, with with clients and and the research, and and I think also from from Favreau. So, how do you, you know, if you are a studio um, that are not in a position of, of kind of having the diversity from from the beginning, uh, because a lot of you know, there's a lot of conversation now around. Okay, well, how do we how do we work with this? And and most you know, bigger studios, bigger publishers are. Uh, very clearly stating that this is an important question for them, but but how do we make sure that this is not just talk, that you know there's some actual actions? I mean, you know, from from a leader to a leader, what would you say? Okay, th these are some concrete things you can do to to actually make change. Well, I think that you should definitely, you know, diversity is is as you said, it's a CEO level question. If it's important to the to the studio to have the benefits of diversity it also comes with the cost of diversity because i think you what you said is you know if you have a homogeneous studio with very clear processes and and structure things can be very very efficient because you're not really creating that space for uh, conversations and conflict uh, but if you have a diverse studio and you have you know all these different viewpoints and and different perspectives then that's going to you know it's going to take time for people to come together and have the conversations and understand each other's viewpoints and you have to build a culture that you know allows for that to happen you have to have the trust for people to really, you know, be vulnerable to share differing opinions and to be able to respectfully, you know, converse and then to disagree. And I think that, you know, as you said, many big companies right now are, are kind of jumping on the diversity wagon because they now realize that, you know, not only is it the right thing to do, but you kind of have to do that in, in today's climate. You can't be the company that's anti-diversity. That's not a great, that's not a great message, but, you know, the difference is if you really care about it, if you really want the benefits of diversity, then it's going to, you know, you're going to often have this situation where you have uh, a group of candidates that are kind of very similar to the majority of, of the people that you have in your studio. And you're going to have, uh, you know, what we call more diverse studios or people who are different. And uh, you often then get into the conversations, well, this person has more experience and they have, you know, uh, you know, their, their background is stronger, their competence in, you know, as defined by, you know, the skill that we're going after is perceived to be higher than this diverse candidate. And this, I think, you know, can lead to the 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 sort of the the self fulfilling prophecy that you continue to hire people who are like yourself because you you know you feel like they're a better fit. They have skills that you understand better, but you then get you know this homogeneous team, and so you really have to understand also that the way that you evaluate candidates is based on your own internal models of how you assess people that also might be very biased because you tend to rank the things that resonate with you and the things that you're familiar with and understand higher than new skills or new competencies that you know you might understand less and i think that this is a, a super complex conversation and it uh uh, it requires an understanding of a lot of nuance and it also under you know requires people if if they you know people often talk that talk about diversity being super important until they get into the practicalities of hiring when they default to more to kind of older behaviors uh, so if it is a priority everyone in the organization has to be on board with it and you have to also be able to engage with it um i i am um... You know, one of the things um, that that I, th I think helps is, you know, I, I try to always think about uh, how is this person a culture add rather than a culture fit. I try to say, you know, in, you know, every, you know, how how do every person contribute to building the culture, you know, one step further. Um, that that's I guess that's the best uh, you know input I have. You know, one thing that I thought about now when you said this. Um, you know, a few years ago, when when uh, hashtag Me Too was was very topical, 
um, I was I, I wrote an article that was that was published and and uh, uh, quite well spread. And then uh, the, the French newspaper Le Monde did an interview and and they asked about leadership uh, practices and you know how how to change those. And and you know I I said a couple of things that I thought, but but I didn't really think they were very specific, to be honest. To uh, I just I just thought they were you know a good practices. And, and and I had to ask the interview. I said you know the other people that you have interviewed, uh, what what have they said? <laughs> you know I was so curious. Um and and you know she was telling me a couple of the things that the other people that she interviewed have said, and uh, and I was like. Yeah, but that just sounds like kind of good leadership. <laughs> it's not. Uh, it's not necessarily like we have to do something like totally different. It, it it was more about having a couple of these things, you know, very very you know top of mind. But I also think, uh, in all sincerity, I mean, you know, both John and I are, you know, middle aged white men, and and I think for us this conversation is also you know pro you know a little bit awkward. Uh, you know, it's like we should probably not be in the front of it in many weeks. You know, we're we're not a representation of diversity, and and you know, if you are in a CEO or or senior leadership position, uh, you know, these questions can can be awkward. Do you have any Do you have any advice for? Uh, I mean, I guess this is a bit close to home, but 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 I really would like your opinion. You know, do you have advice to senior leaders, especially actually, you know, men from the minority group? You know, how how, how do we make this less awkward so we get to more action? I think that's a super great question. I think, you know, I, I can definitely sympathize that, you know, if, if you're a, a middle-aged white man today, uh, you know, you feel like there's a lot of, of groups of people that are, you know, expressing their frustration and their pain and, and for, you know, having been uh, discriminated against or or uh, or mistreated, and I think that a lot of of a uh, lot of white men feel like, well, you know, I'm not racist, I'm not sexist. I try to, you know, treat everyone with respect. Uh, I feel super awkward about participating in these conversations, and I don't feel like there's anything that I am doing that's not uh, that's not right. And and you know, I feel. Um, somewhat unfairly judged and unfairly treated and I find this to be a very painful and a fraught conversation and I'm worried about you know saying the right the wrong things so I, I, I definitely I definitely think that's true but I think that you know and, and I had this conversation with a, a, a co-worker recently where I was saying well I think that you know as so, like someone like myself who's definitely struggled with feeling like an imposter early on in my career and feeling other and feeling different and feeling like you know my ideas aren't as valid because I'm not our game's core core audience and and you know someone who really struggled with fitting into the industry for a long time I think that you know I don't really fight for diversity in my teams or or within the games industry because it's a it's a passion project of mine and and uh, I, I really want to do that on top of my day job I do it because I can feel the effects of discrimination and I felt the effects of discrimination on my own skin and I've accumulated a lot of, of scars and a lot of pain through my journey and so when I engage in these conversations with my colleagues and my co-workers and share my experiences I do that with the purposes of, of education and improvement for all so what I would ask of the middle-aged white man is to say okay I you know I recognize I see your pain I don't necessarily you know feel I'm contributing to it on a day-to-day -day basis but I'm willing to listen and to learn and to understand your perspective and to engage in these conversations because I feel like the silence that we often see from, from white men is, you know, if, if I don't know what's happening in, in your head, I just think that you don't care. You might be struggling with all these complex emotions and really wanting to engage, but not knowing how. But if you don't reach out and if you don't participate in the conversation, the only thing I can read is that you don't care about it. Uh, cool. Um, I think hopefully we can see this conversation as part of that. Then, <laughs> um, if we switch over to to something different, um, but also a big challenge right now, uh, which is um, remote work. Um, we uh, we've seen that um, some students were very well prepared for this, 
Um, some studios were even founded on the idea that, okay, we're going to be a distributed team from, from start. And for them, it's been almost like no change. And, and we've seen some teams who are truly struggling right now and, and then everything in between. Um, what do you, I mean, what's, what, what's your playbook right now? I mean, how, um, you know, a, a, a studio that might not already be fully distributed, might not have the, you know, the, the, the practices and tools and so forth in place and, you know, ha have to walk, you know, have to make the journey to, to, to become a distributed studio. Um, what is your, you know, kind of concrete, you know, tips for, for uh, what to think and what to do? I think that, you know, our experience has been that, you know, as a small, relatively new studio uh, where we have a, a strong culture of, of kind of personal autonomy and freedom um, and, uh, and, and a very good, you know, IT infrastructure, like our experience of, of kind of having to transfer to remote work uh, due to COVID was uh, incredibly impressive. Uh, and I was definitely glad to not be a part of a, a you know, a, a multinational corporation with thousands of people because I can't imagine what transitioning that online must feel like. But now that we're a few months into this, I mean, Zoom fatigue is very real. Uh, and I think that, you know, many studios are kind of having a similar experience where it's like, okay, we're now replicating the structure and the process and the way that we used to work as a, a mostly on location studio, but now having to figure out a kind of remote first ways of, of working. And I think that's a, it's a, it's a super interesting challenge and it's something that, you know, uh, we talk about a lot at the studio. We're experimenting with with different tools and different ways of working. And then you obviously couple it with the the experience of of now you're all of a sudden at home. You have you know your family at home during work hours. Your kids are there. You might need to homeschool them. Like different times work differently for uh, for different people. Uh, and so I think that you know this is is. Uh, you know, I think it's a super exciting time. I think it's a super interesting time. And I think one of the things that I at least have realized is that the, you know, we've, many of us been working in, in open offices uh, and, and in these kind of team-based workspaces. I don't think I've talked to anyone who really misses the hustle and the bustle of the open office. So I think that that, you know, whatever the future holds is is probably not going to be that. And I think that, you know, we're going to see this combination of on location with a heavy remote capabilities. And I think that also means that, you know, some people used to be super great, you know, engaging in person, but now all of a sudden you're doing most of your interactions through asynchronous means or through Zoom meetings. So, you know, all of a sudden new qualities in, and new competencies in, in kind of collaboration are going to make some people way better suited to the remote working situation than others. Uh, and I, I, you know, I think we're just at the start of that, but I think that, you know, we're seeing a tremendous acceleration of the remote work. I have a good example of that. Um, you know, before uh, coronavirus, uh, I was interviewed a few times around uh, how to lead uh, introverts. And, and now the bigger question is how, how to lead extroverts. Uh, in, in, in an online environment, because uh, what I've seen is, 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 is that actually some of the people that are struggling the most with this new environment are, are people that are quite extroverted. Um, and, and, you know, as a leader, you know, you need to, to think a little bit extra about you know, how, how do you handle that? And the ones that are um, coping a bit better are, are people that have a more, uh, you know, introvert, you know, bias. Um, how do you... Um, uh, do you think that you will go back to, to the, the, the normal like it was before? Or do you think that there will be a, a new normal for your studio where, you know, you're not simply going back to how it was before Corona, but it, it's something, you know, different, more of a hybrid? I, I you know, I, I don't feel like I can answer that, like, conclusively. But my my hunch is that, you know, the, the new nor normal is going to be more hybridized as you say i think that you know i i i feel like for just people in general uh, a lot of people have been realizing how much time they've been spending you know doing their daily commute to get to work uh on location time that you know everyone has been saving 
right now. Uh, and I think that, you know, people are realizing the opportunity to, you know, to make, figure out how to do productive work remotely. And, you know, that's probably going to cause some kind of, you know, redistribution for, from cities just due to cost of living. And I think people will want to have more flexibility and more freedom. And I find it very likely that Bonfire, like every other place, is just going to be impacted by those trends and will, you know, try and reconfigure uh, in a way that's kind of best suited for the studio. But I think that the, you know, the concern that productivity would drop massively uh, due to kind of remote working is, is you know, that's not proven to be, uh, you know, a super relevant concern. I think that the more relevant concern right now is how do you stop people from, you know, just kind of throwing themselves into work to escape kind of uh, our, our very strange reality right now. <laughs> I guess you've seen, uh, have you seen the extra episode of uh, Mythic Quest? Mythic Quest um, I, I have Frankest? not. No, I need to. I oh, need you to, have so, to see that because oh. the point you made now is one of the themes of that specific episode. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. I love that show. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, great. Um, yeah, there's a lot of things about that show that feels almost like too close to reality. Absolutely. I hope you enjoyed that interview. I certainly did. If you want to elevate yourself as a modern leader and help your teams become even more successful, then check out Favor Academy at favor.com. They will find podcasts, webinars, articles, all free of charge. Check it out.